verbal abuse, sexual abuse, doxing, uh, etc. More often than not, this harassment is targeted at women and women belonging to marginalized sections. These are also aimed at prominent individuals who represent the uh, cause and concerns for marginalized communities. The result of such harassment is exclusion of some of the most vulnerable sections of society from the digital space. In our session today, we would be covering a host of issues, including the work that uh, uh, the work that we all of us have been performing in this space and how it can contribute to the existing discourse on online harassment as well as some possible solutions for the way forward. I will briefly begin with an introduction. My name is Arjun Adrian D'Souza and I work as a volunteer legal counsel at SFLC.in. This is a New Delhi based digital rights organization in India. SFLC.in has been working to defend the digital rights of citizens over the past decade. We have published an online harassment report which details online harassment faced by women and marginalized sections as one of the most prominent forms of censorship which is arising today. Towards this end, SFLC also operates a free speech tracker which tracks violations of free speech and the relevant laws which are in place to tackle this. We have a wonderful panel today, and I will begin by introducing our panelists who have logged in online. We have Afra, who works as a regional project manager in the Digital Defenders Partnership Program at HEVOS. She has been involved in a number of non-profit organizations and research projects for the past 12 years. She is also a research fellow at the Asia Research Center, Indonesia. Her research and projects mainly concern media, youth, movement, and digital rights. She develops modules and educational materials, as well as facilitates training on digital security, privacy, and disinformation. At DDP, she is responsible for managing the regional team in Asia to support human rights defenders and journalists. We have Hija Kamran, who is also a digital rights advocate from Pakistan, and she has an experience of almost 10 years in the area. She has led key technology policy, research and campaigning initiatives and has informed the landscape as it stands today. Her areas of focus include gender and technology, privacy, data protection, freedom of expression, meaningful access, human rights, access to information and internet governance. At APC, Hija coordinates women's rights program content and is the editor of GenderIT.org. So these were our online panelists. I will come to our phys uh, panelists who are present with us here today. We have Ellen, who is sitting to the left of me, and she is the head of Digital at Risks subdivision at SafeNet, which is Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. Her work focuses on the policy advocacy of online gender-based violence in Indonesia, including through documenting and building the network of the issue, developing, designing support mechanisms, and knowledge transfer for the victims. She is also involved with multi-stakeholder collaborations. We have Radhika, who is also, who, who is also uh, a counsel at SFLC.in. She is a lawyer by training. She works on issues of internet shutdowns, speech, and harassment. She has also given multiple trainings to women and marginalized groups to teach them basics of digital hygiene and privacy. She was the open internet leader for democracy. So we will be fielding the online questions. I uh, encourage our participants online uh, to please post the questions that they have in the chat. Whereas any uh, questions from the audience, I please request everyone to reserve the questions towards the end and we will take up as many as possible. So to begin, with our session today, right? Uh, I will ask Hija, Hija, what do you think the role of state actors is in creating a safe space for women and marginalized groups online?
out of their protections and uh, he uh, just, he just, just give us a give moment, us a moment. Uh, we're, not, we're not able to show you, show you, just give us a moment. Uh, uh, we're not able to show you, just give us a moment. Uh, so, uh, so, so I think we can, think we can proceed, proceed with, with uh, uh, Ellen. 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 Ellen, can you Ellen, share, can you share your, your insights and experiences in operating a helpline for, for women in Indonesia? In Indonesia. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank, you. thank you. I'm not sure, I'm why, not sure why there is a recall. recall. Maybe someone Maybe still... still... Okay. okay. So, so in Indonesia, Indonesia we... we... Uh, at SAFTA, uh, Southeast South Asia Freedom, Asia Freedom of Expression, of Expression Network, Network, we advocate for, for, for digital, digital rights, rights mainly, mainly the, the access, to, access internet, to internet, uh, freedom, of, freedom expression, of expression, and then, and then the digital, digital security. security. And then we, and then see, we see the online gender based violence, violence in Indonesia, in Indonesia is, is very much, very much um, um, kind of abundant, abundant because, because no, one no one really focuses, really focuses on, that. on that. So, so in 2019, we become a partner, a partner uh, for, the for the National Commission, Commission on, violence on Violence Against Women in Indonesia, Indonesia. and then, and then uh, we partner as their, their digital, digital security consultant. So, so if they if receive, receive any report any on online database violence cases, and then the victim needs um, consultation on digital security, then uh, it will be directed to us. But then um, it just not enough to do that. So we uh, we develop the helpline uh, to not only receive the referral from the National Commission on Violence Against Women, but we open it for public in 2020. And then I think it's still not enough because the case is a lot, but the victim itself is not really educated on what is happening, um, what is uh, they're experiencing, and so on. So. We also, at the start, um, make a guidebooks, a very simple guidebooks about what is online gender-based violence itself and what can they do what, if there is someone uh, witnessing or um, want to accompany the victims or to be the service providers per se for the online gender-based violence victims, they can just read these guidebooks. And we provide it online for free. Uh, it's on the PDF format. Everyone can download it, as far as I know, until um, until early this year. It's already been downloaded for more than 25,000 times. So I think it helps, right? Because so many people are downloading this and then use it. And it's not only the public, the general public that use um, our guidebooks. It's also the Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection. It's also other service providers that doesn't really understand about digital rights, but they are uh, providing for the victims of online, uh, not only online gender-based violence, but also the gender, uh, the, 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 the common gender-based violence, right? So. There is also that, and then uh, it doesn't stop at there because we found that three fourth every year, uh, three fourth of the cases that we receive is only is on non-consensual dissemination of intimate images. So we also make a guidebook or a quick guide on what is the victim supposed to do when they are facing the, on, uh, the threat of non-consensual dissemination of intimate images. Um, and every step that we usually give towards the victim about what they are supposed to do, or what kind of help they uh, are able to access and so on, we put it here. We also put the link to report directly to digital platforms and um, some type of tips, practical tips that they can have when they are reporting to the police and so on. So I think that becomes our best practice. So what type of uh, help that we provide, services that we provide, we, also, we usually uh, make a guidebook on that and then we also educate the people who reach out to our helpline to also read the book first. And then let's see, let's go from there and uh, what can we do for you. 
but um, mostly for uh, helpline that the SafeNet uh, built, which is called AWAS KBGO, or in English it would be a Beware of Online Gender-Based Violence Helpline. It is mainly providing two services with a bonus, uh, one bonus services. <laughs> but, uh, the first is, of course, uh, digital security and privacy consultancy. So we give them any uh, suggestion on how they could uh, increase their uh, digital security and so on settings, uh, the privacy settings, the security settings, because most of them don't really understand how to uh, have it their own way. Also, the second wise, the second uh, services that we give is to uh, help them escalate the report to the digital platforms because SafeNet is part of a trusted partner of several giant uh, social media platforms in Indonesia such as Meta, Instagram, WhatsApp, TikTok, uh, and so on, right? So we are able to escalate directly to the platform itself. So when they report it directly through the apps and they don't receive any um, expected uh, result, they can reach out to us and then uh, let us uh, escalate it to the digital platforms, which um, kind of helpful because uh, some of the reporting system that the social media company have doesn't really give out uh, uh, room to argue why this is a harassment that they need uh, the platform to take some action, right? So that is the services that we have. But then we see a lot of these victims uh, has a very traumatized situation and they are very, oftentimes when they report it to us, they are often panicky. So usually we refer them uh, to the uh, organization that uh, provided counseling psychological counseling services, right? But most of the times, um, the victims, when we refer them, they don't reach out to the, uh, the, the, the counselor because the problem is they don't have money or they are scared about what kind of mechanism that they can uh, access by contacting them. So right now we are uh, receiving crowdfunding uh, from a um, crowdfund uh, called Kita Bisa in Indonesia, and they gave us some some money uh, to directly provide the counseling, uh, the psychological counseling for the victims. So what we do is um, we refer them, of course, but then we help them schedule the psychological counseling. So they, so we know that they really get the counseling, and not. Um, not just like giving, this is the number and then you can contact them. No, we uh, schedule the counseling and then uh, the, the the crowdfunding who gave us the donation, uh, we, we use the money to provide that. So there is three services that we uh, right now give uh, to the victim itself. So the helpline Indonesia by Awaska BGO is that, but we also have Task Force KBGO, uh, one of my colleagues, um, a senior, that uh, a mentor of me, uh, Dita Chaturani, uh, maybe some of you already know her. Uh, she also initiated a helpline called Task Force KBGO, uh, Task Force for All Non-Gender Based Violence uh, Victim, and they provide a more holistic uh, handle uh, handling of the situation too. I can talk a lot more about this, but I think uh, the time is short. But just uh, let me, Safnet has a booth in the IGF village, and I do have these two books and another research on uh, how the online gender-based violence uh, against the woman human rights defender situation in Indonesia. And you can also visit the booth to get the, those research um, publications and also these two guidelines if you would like to know more about Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, I think guidelines and guidebooks become a great way of crystallizing the relief that you can provide to women and marginalized groups. Uh, Radhika, I'd come to you and ask in your experience in conducting security trainings for women, uh, how do you see that going about in actually providing relief? 
we all saw how during the pandemic everything just moved online all of a sudden you know today uh, you know children were going to schools and then tomorrow they were just there online trying to navigate through devices right and a lot of and and the government did a very good job in trying to migrate it but one thing that that they missed was to give like a basic security training to these to these uh, you know these young girls and these young children for example we did these trainings for uh, you know students who were uh, 12 to 15 years old and they used shared devices we're a country with very limited economic and social resources which means that uh, you know a lot of children uh, use shared devices to access their online education what happens when they use these shared devices is that uh, they don't they don't know that they need to protect their pictures that they shouldn't be sending their pictures to somebody that you know uh, it, they should uh, not be giving out passwords that, and and we have a lot of scams right so a lot of them fell for it their pictures were shared a lot of uh, young girls their devices were taken away because we are also a slightly conservative society which means that uh, you know, if your parents think that you're uh, chatting with a boy, right, uh, or you're sharing pictures, your device will get taken away right then and there. So that also means that their, their education is taken away. And the pandemic lasted for two years. It's very recently that, uh, you know, uh, uh, children have gone back to school. Uh, see, and the problem with running these helplines and running these trainings are uh, that, uh, that, of course, there is a very... There's the lack of resources that we have. You can there's so many children and there's so many people out there. So you can only train very specific ones. You can only you know provide education material to some of them, and uh, they're not uh, they're not very keen. I feel like edtech in India has also taken off quite a bit. Uh, you have multi-millionaire um, you know these uh, these startups, uh, these companies which are doing a lot of online education. And what we feel is uh, even there, like a basic digital security class would not take anything more than 45 minutes, right? That's missing, right? And it's not because they don't, it's not because, you know, uh, they don't want to spend their resources on that. They're, it's because there is not enough knowledge that certain things like this happen. To give to give you an example, as a lawyer, we, you know, we take pro bono online harassment class. Uh, uh, cases. Uh, there have been multiple times when women have reached out to us and said that, oh, we get unsolicited calls at 12 o'clock at night, at 1 o'clock at night, and they go to the police station. Our police stations are wonderful. In front of them, there will be graffitis which says that, you know, one in five women face online harassment. But when you actually go approach the cop, they will refuse to register a first information report. They would refuse to take up your case. They would tell you that, do you want us to go find murderers or do you want us to find people who are calling you at 12 at night? And what do you do? You suffer through it. This, this distinction that online harassment will not translate into offline violence is one barrier that has to be broken into to be able to, you know, to just... Uh, uh, address this well. Uh, our government has also like introduced a couple of websites. There is a cyber, uh, you know, cyber crime, uh, you know, website on which you can register a complaint. But it's again for only women and children. Uh, we also feel that even though that it's an easy to use platform and you know, you can do a lot with it. But there is no f like there is no quick redress. Uh, and that happens because our law enforcement is not equipped. And I say this not only for India, but I say this for across South Asia, right, Ellen? That our law enforcement is just not equipped. You know, you would see that, uh, you know, you, uh, like these, these, these pages of documentation. So they'll tell you that, oh, give us the documentation. That documentation will be in form of printouts that will lie on, uh, you know, in a cyber, in a police station if your complaint is registered. Anybody can have access with that. Any black, any kind of blackmailing that can happen. So I think for me, the one thing that has really come out to me is that internet is, what, 25, 30 years old, right? All of these things are very new things that we're seeing. And there's not enough sensitization that's happening. There is not enough, uh, we don't know well enough how is law enforcement reacting on it, how, um, you know, how are these uh, private players, how are these companies reacting on it, the big tech is reacting on it when we see this. And a lot can be done with, you know, just 
like you know making peer to peer networks which can educate each other on how to combat such things thank you radhika uh, i'll come to our online panelists now uh, hija uh, i'll come back to the question i had asked so in your experience what do you think the role of state actors is in creating a safe space for women and marginalized communities online Uh, can we shift to the Zoom link, please? Ah, uh, Hija, no, we can't hear you. We're trying to uh, troubleshoot. Uh, yes, Hija, can you please uh, go ahead? Sorry, the operator, I think you need to change the audio settings from the Zoom to the speaker. Yes, yes, can you can try 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 Hello, 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 h
Hello? Hello? Am I audible? Am I audible? Hello, 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 h
Thank you for that, Hija. Uh, I think there is much to be said about laws that must be well represented. I'll come to you, Afra. Uh, can you tell us some of the challenges you have faced in your work supporting human rights and uh, journalists uh, today?
Thank you, Afra, for that. Uh, I'll quickly leave the floor open for any questions we have, whether in uh, online attendance or here. So please ask your questions. And if you want a specific panelist to answer it, please also specify. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, hello, everyone. It was nice hearing all of your interesting experience. I'm Marie Benaisa from Tunisia. I'm a researcher on gender-based cyber violence. Um, hearing all of your experience and your work in the different countries, I really can relate deeply to what you're saying because we're facing the exact same issues, the exact same challenges, the lack of access to psychological support, the lack of access to legal support, um, the social stigma against the victims. We're facing these uh, issues, legal issues also. So. In Tunisia, for example, we do not currently have a law that um, targets gender-based cyber violence. We have a law that targets gender-based violence in general or cyber violence in general, but not gender-based cyber violence. Uh, we also have many, many, many challenges, many other challenges, and we do not have NGOs that works specifically on this issue. You are lucky to start this in your country, and I'm planning to start an, um, a project in Tunisia, so I would like to hear from you some um, advice, some lesson learned from your experience, especially when you started in the beginning. How, how did you start? Which stakeholders did you reach out to? Which challenges did you face in the beginning? Funding, sustainability, other things. And thank you so much. <laughs> Ellen, do you want to take that up, please? Okay, so um, I can share what uh, Awaska BGO has started. Uh, we started with discussion with the multi-stakeholder. We invite the CSO who is um, providing services and support for the victims. We also include Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection into the discussion, also with the National Commission on Violence Against Women, and also the plat digital platform itself because we have uh, their representation. So we sit together and I just like, here is the fact and what can we do together? So uh, first, the first one who reached out to us is the National Commission on Violence Against Women. Uh, like I said before, they asked us uh, to be the digital security consultant whenever they receive a, a report from the online database violence victims, right? But it's, we started it, we started a conversation in 2019 and we right away published these guidelines. And because this guideline is so helpful for the other, um, the other organization or the other stakeholder to really understand the basic on what is online gender-based violence. I think because of that, we can like start bigger, start like expand our scope of discussion, not only uh, stopping at discussion, but then building up the helpline itself, what we can provide with the helpline itself. And um, we decide what type of services that we are having. Like I only, we, ha we only have two, right? The digital consultants, uh, the, the digital security consultants and privacy consultancy also the report escalation to the digital platform because that is our um, capacity. But on the other side, when the victim needs legal support uh, or they need psychological support. We do have networks that we can connect with and then um, every stakeholder seems like they are trying to contribute to this matter. Even the Ministry of Empower Women Empowerment and Child Protection, they made an MOU with us together to intervene the the law enforcement, because they don't really understand uh, the situation of online gender-based violence. We do have law um, on online uh, setting, right? Like uh, we we have electronic information and trans and transaction law, but but the inside of that law, there is rubber article that could really criminalize the victim itself. And just this year, we passed the uh, the sexual violence crimes law in Indonesia, which include one article about um, electronic-based sexual violence, which is not much, but okay, we can start on that, right? So, yeah, I think the the 
the best thing to do is to have communication with all of the stakeholders. We are in talks with the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. We are also in talks with the law enforcement, the cyber um, unit or cyber division uh, inside the, the national police. Yeah, so we, we, we talk to everyone. So, and then we develop the way we could, the way we understand our own capacity, and then the way we um, disseminate, disseminate the information itself through very simple languages, through something that everyone can just click and read and understand w what is the severity of online database, what is the, uh, the support that, that, that they can really access readily at hand, the practical tips on what can they do at hand when they are experiencing online gender-based violence, how the journalists can also coverage, um, uh, have uh, online gender-based coverage, news coverage and so on. So just practical, practical things uh, and tips that we disseminate Thank you, Every Ellen. Time. I'm sorry to yeah. cut you off. We'll Thank just steal one more question and pause it of time and we'll wrap it up then. Uh, please, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Kashif Roger from Pakistan. I am a human rights activist and focusing child protection and uh, gender-based violence, uh, especially on online spaces. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the panelists, um, uh, Radhika, Ellen, and um, Hija. Uh, it's, uh, you spoke very well on uh, respective uh, uh, topics. My specific question is to the Rija. Uh, can you hear me, Rija? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, your detailed perspective on state actors' role in online um, uh, spaces. Uh, um, um, I think uh, there are, you also mentioned in your uh, brief uh, uh, discussion uh, there is a lot of legislation, and, uh, but uh, we are lacking on the part of implementation in Pakistan. Uh, that's true. But uh, on the other side, I also see that uh, the role of the civil society is also lacking. I know it's, uh, the digital um, uh, security is uh, very new for the least developed or uh, uh, global south uh, in global south. Uh, but CSO roles need to be more enhanced, and uh, especially in Pakistan, I feel that the engagement with the government on the implementation. You know, we have a lot of legislation, but uh, still we are uh, failed to develop rule of business. Even we have services are available, but communities are not aware. Other part is that we need to enhance uh, our within the uh, uh, network alliances, which are not uh, at the moment are very much uh, intact or uh, coming together, working together uh, for the issues we are facing, challenges at the policy level and the state actors uh, more uh, effective role uh, in digital, um, uh, you know, uh, privacy. So what, what is your thoughts and recommendations, how we come together as a civil society network? It would not only for the um, so can we just uh, ask the question? Yeah. We're running short yeah, of time. Yeah, I'm just Thank coming you. the conclusion for the questions. How we can come to that? It would be beneficial for not only for Pakistan, South Asia, and Global South as well. We are facing uh, similar challenges. Uh, I want to know your thoughts and recommendations, uh, how it could be uh, we go better in that way. Thank you. Rija.
Thank you, Hija, for that. Uh, in just continuance, I will have a uh, you in two minutes just say one thing that you would like in order f to transform this landscape of online gender-based violence. Uh, these can constitute our conclusive remarks and we will wrap up this session then. Uh, Hija, why don't you go first? That, uh, Hija. Uh, I'll come to you, Afra, please. Uh, Afra, can, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for that, Afra. I'll come to my panelists to my left. Uh, Radhika, if you can go first. Uh, I deeply believe that it's communities, uh, you know, more than anything else that can help alleviate this. So sensitization, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, it doesn't have to be, you know, a civil society telling, you know, other people uh, uh, on the margins that you have to do this, you have to do that. Rather them pure learning from each other, understanding why it's so important, and I think contextualizing it in the social political context of the country is quite helpful. Thank you. Ellen? Yeah, I think the most important thing is we need to understand, like, Internet Governance Forum itself, uh, all, always pressing for multi-stakeholder multi uh, collaboration, right? Uh, we, sh we just sh should just do that, multi-stakeholder in our countries and get the communication going, the discussion going, the collaboration going. Yeah, I think that's it uh, that I would like to emphasize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhika and Ellen. So I think uh, we would have to keep continuing the discourse on online gender-based vi uh, violations and come up with solutions so that a multi-stakeholder effort can be put and uh, we come out in an open, safe and transparent environment which becomes a safe space for marginalized communities uh, in the online sphere. Thank you everyone for participating today and we will uh, uh, finish the session here. Thank you.